Bye, everyone. Hi. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to our Tech Talks discussion. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you for our speakers for joining us this afternoon. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Cayman Tech City, who have partnered with Digital Cayman and the Blockchain Association of the Cayman Islands for making this event happen. If you have any questions today for our speakers, please send those through the Digital Cayman Slack channel. It's called Virtual Assets Working Group. Following the panel discussion, we'll have time for a Q&A session and we'll read your questions then. Um, I know the session is going to be action-packed and full of new ideas, so without further delay, I'm pleased to pass it over to Piotr, who's moderating today's discussion. Over to you. Thanks, Caitlin. Really appreciate it. Um, so, Rahul, thank you very much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I know you've been involved in this space for a while. You've tweeted about it, spoken about it a lot. I know at Real Vision, you guys have got the crypto gathering coming up. So really looking forward to getting your insights. Um, I thought a fun place to kick it off would be to find out how did you first find out about Bitcoin and then when did it actually click for you? So when did you have that sort of aha moment about all of this? Well, Bitcoin, I think for most people is not a single kind of click moment. So mm -hmm. first I observed it probably from about 2011, something like that. It kind of appeared on my radar screen because it was starting to get press and publicity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone was watching the Silk Road um, saga as that was unveiling around that time as well. But really, it was one of my um, friends who had built a crypto exchange called ItBit, which was one of the earlier exchanges. And I had written a little bit about it in Global Macro Investor, my kind of research service. And he came to me and said, listen, I don't know what you really know about this. And I said, not a lot yet. It's just a passing interest because, you know, it seems to be related to finance, but we don't really get our heads around it. So he kind of talked me through it initially. Um, and I bought Bitcoin back then in 2013 it was the first time that I got involved in Bitcoin. I wrote an article uh, 2013 as well about how I looked at Bitcoin. So, well, listen, they're calling it digital gold. So let's look at it versus gold and say, let's look at the total amount of discoverable gold, the total amount above ground and how much comes above ground each year. So what's called a stock to flow model. And I didn't really know much about that, but I figured, well, that's a way of valuing it. So I looked at Bitcoin at the time and then looked at, um, uh, looked at gold. And I said, listen, you know, with gold at 1200, where it was then, um, I think Bitcoin should have been worth a million dollars. So I was like, okay, this to me looks like a macro thing because it's a it looks like it's some sort of currency or rare asset that has a value people don't understand yet so that's when i started investing in it and writing about it and that article went viral around silicon valley because it was the first time anyone really applied a macro framework to it and again mine was really you know on the back of an envelope calculation didn't really understand and i followed it then realizing that the social mood of the world had changed as well you know with central bank printing the Occupy Wall Street movement, the feeling that people were being disadvantaged and didn't understand how or why, I realized that something like this might be something that people would find of value. You know, and the whole Silk Road narrative was, was also you know, the Tor network and how there was a dark web and how people didn't want to operate with government eyes and all of this stuff. So that was the early days of Bitcoin. And I followed the narrative then all the way to 2017, where I'd realized, look, I thought Bitcoin had a real value, and I only thought of it kind of in the currency terms, in its rarity terms. And then they started developing forks, which were different variations. And I'm like, well, I don't understand any of this now. How can you have another variation of the same thing? And it's slightly different. I can't understand the value. And then I kind of dropped it for a while and sold out far too early. I sold, I bought it at 200, sold it at 2000, and then it went up to 20,000 that year. And then I came back to it again, and then went down the rabbit hole that everybody else goes down, where you suddenly realized how big this whole digital space is, mm -hmm. uh, and how it's kind of about to change everything. Yeah. 
No, I mean, agreed 100%. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, the interesting thing I wanted to find out is you mentioned you bought Bitcoin the first time in 2013, and then you bought afterwards. How have you found that experience to differ? Because if you bought in 2013, you must have some more stories and seen how the process has gotten easier. Actually, I don't think it's got much easier. And no. there, are there are reasons for that. So when I bought on ItBit, it was based in Singapore. There was the typical know your clients because they're a bunch of ex Goldman guys, very professional. So it was well run. So usual KYC transferred my bitcoins across and bought it in the usual way. You know, the the the, the, the trading application is pretty straightforward. And you know, nowadays I've used Kraken, Coinbase, and others, and it's all the same. It's buying. It's simple. It's opening an account that requires so much KYC stuff. It's remarkable. It's something I've observed. I don't really understand why somebody like KPMG, for example, doesn't start an independent KYC application where everybody could do their KYC on it so you can open an account digitally or with a bank account or a mobile phone everywhere because it's that process that makes it really clunky. Um, but once you open it, you know, it's the same as opening a brokerage account. You buy and sell things on it and transfer it in and out. So it's, it's not that. It's, it's just it's laborious. No, definitely agreed. I mean, we've all gone through it and it's very painful these days. Yeah. Um, you mentioned stock to flow. I know you follow plan B quite a lot as well. Um, I know you're a macro guy, so you really get this. Can you maybe just explain to us what stock to flow is and why that makes so much sense in the Bitcoin context? Well, this guy, plan B, um, I saw him right on Twitter. Um, he's an unknown person. I mean, I've spoken to him, but I, I don't know actually his name. Um, he's a Dutchman working for a family office in Holland. Um, and he's a um, econometrician. And so what he'd done is using the same idea that I'd had, but with much more sophisticated methodology, he just said, okay, well, usually rare assets have a stock to flow, which means their valuation is based on how much new supply can come on versus the total supply. Now, Bitcoin, if you think about it, it's 21 million Bitcoins. So by the time you're at 18 million Bitcoins, you've only got 3 million left to come and they come at a, at a certain rate. So that's the stock, the stock that's also above ground now or that has been mined. And then the flow is what comes on top. So it's a, it's a decreasing amount versus the total amount. And that makes it rare. And that's the same attribute that gold has. And it actually is the same attribute silver has, diamonds have, and certain other assets. So his idea was to prove it mathematically. So he looked at it and said, okay, if I put, uh, I put it in statistical analysis, I can look to prove that this is the case. And that's what he did in his work. He proved that it basically follows this linear path of price appreciation based around its rarity. Now it assumes there's, a, there's an amount of demand for it because you can have a rare asset with no demand, in which case it doesn't work. But if you've got a relatively st steady demand for something or an increasing demand, what you get is um, a price that moves in a linear fashion according to its stock to flow. So when stock becomes a much larger part of the flow, it tends to appreciate in price. And when he put all assets on this, what he found is that Bitcoin was kind of the rarest of all. Because as you get towards that 21 million, you end up with no flow at all. So also what's interesting and unique about Bitcoin is the fact that within the algorithm is a way of throttling back new supply. So in mining, how that tends to happen is it's driven by cost. So mining of gold, it's driven by cost um, and technology and also the boom bust cycle of commodities. So when the gold price goes up a lot, a lot of people go in, they mine more of it and the price drops. But with Bitcoin, you can't do that because of how it's actually physically limited in supply by the mathematical formula that's underlying it. So it has a very, very unique thing. And, and when I saw him write about it, it was just like, wow, yeah, incredible to understand what makes it so rare? And there's a fantastic book, if anybody's on the journey of going down the rabbit hole of understanding this, called um, um, The Bitcoin Standard by Safety and Amos, who's also speaking at the Real Vision Crypto Gathering event. Um, that tells you and shows you the relationship that hard assets have for value. 
and why humans value certain things that wouldn't ordinarily have a value. There's, there's no real reason a shiny gold metal has value. Yes, in the element, uh, uh, you know, of all of the uh, elements, it is one of the rarest and also one of the most durable and it can never be destroyed. So there's some certain elements, but humans attach value to those things because it allows us to store value and transfer value and devise things into smaller increments. So that's the system of money. And that's what Bitcoin slots into a new version of digital money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to continue on that, I mean, you talked about scarcity. And in the last while, we've seen excessive money printing. So scarcity of money has sort of taken the opposite of that. If you compare that and contrast that, what we, you spoke about sort of the value going up if you've got that scarcity with the US dollar, with the excess of printing internationally, what do you see the impact of that being on economies and the world? Yes, yeah, so if we step back a bit, so we, we've now established that gold and Bitcoin have this peculiar quality that means that we can attach some value to it potentially. We need enough people to adopt it to do it. And that's what happened with Bitcoin. People have adopted it as a store of value. So things of value are priced against other things. That's how all assets are. You know, if you look at the price of real estate versus gold or oil versus gold or, or oil versus real estate, they all have a, a relative valuation band that they tend to trade in over time. And, and, um, and so with Bitcoin, you can look at it in its denominator terms, which is versus the price of the dollar or the euro or the yen or the Aussie or whatever it is, or the rand. Now, if you think about it, what we're doing is we've got one asset with quantitative easing, which means they're printing more of it. And you're valuing it against another asset that has inbuilt quantitative tightening, which means they're producing less of it, which is Bitcoin. So what you should tend to see over time is value accretion in the thing that has quantitative tightening and value depletion in the thing that has quantitative easing. So why do people want Bitcoin in this world? Well, the problem is, is as you create more and more of an asset that we hold value in, it becomes valueless. So if you think of water, if you're in the desert and you're dying of thirst, a bottle of water is worth infinite amounts of money. So in a credit-driven economy, the flow of cash or credit is, is, is what you need to survive in, in, a, in an economy of that sort. The problem is, is if, you have, if you're surrounded by water and you have too much water, it has no value to you because you can only drink a certain amount. And nobody else wants it because there's too much of it around, so I can't trade it for anything else. So that becomes an issue. So things become valueless when they have too much supply. Well, if money becomes valueless, and we've seen it in many countries, this shouldn't be a new concept to people. We've seen it in Venezuela. We've seen it recently in Iran, where the value of the currency is worthless because people don't believe it to have a store of value. This thing, store of value, is actually just a human behavior. It's what we attribute a value to. There's no reality to any of it. Anything could have a value. And Things like seashells have had a value and a number of different things. Stone in the Yap Islands have had a value because they were rare still and difficult to find new ones. They had a stock to flow. <coughs> but there's no stock to flow of the total cash in the system, in the monetary system. And right now, there's excessive amounts of printing, more printing than we've ever seen in history. So there is a fear amongst people that the value of our money, the, the thing we go to work for, we exchange our physical labor for capital. If that capital is worth less increasingly versus real estate, classic example, it's bloody expensive to buy real estate. Why is that? Well, because there's too much money around. So the price of real estate goes up. Now, if your earnings don't go up in line with real estate, you become poorer versus the value of real estate. And that happens a lot as currencies devalue. And so, People have started to realize that Bitcoin may offer, in one of its attributes, solutions to this problem. And it's the same reason that the, in Cayman, um, the guys at um, uh, SWP started the, the gold vault for the same reason. They kind of saw it and realized that the same issue is people are looking for something and there's gold, 
or there's digital gold. And the digital gold, as you know, offers a whole bunch of other opportunities too. Yep, definitely. Um, so if we sort of accept that fact that Bitcoin is accruing value, more and more people are seeing that value. I know lots of people have talked about Bitcoin being a reserve currency one day. I don't think that's in the near future. If you have to think about the path that we would have to walk to get there, do you think we've got a central bank digital currency in between their corporate coins? What would that path look like? Firstly, my argument would be Bitcoin can be your own reserve currency. It exists without a government, without a corporation that controls it. It is this weird thing that is owned by the crowd and the, and it has its own ecosystem and it can't be manipulated really on mass and it can't be changed. So it has a reserve assets quality to it. So for you and I, we'll buy Bitcoin thinking, actually it's one of our reserve assets. It's something we think will hold value over time. Does it become a reserve asset for everybody? My guess is there will be countries and I'm hearing it through the grapevine of countries who are starting to use Bitcoin as a reserve asset countries that have historically problems with their own currencies. So they start to adopt, like many countries did, they owned gold in the past. But could it be everybody's reserve asset? The problem is with this is, you need to think of it in terms of, we talked about before, opening accounts, closing accounts. In, in the digital world, it's called on-ramps and off-ramps. How do you, how do I use Bitcoin and still pay taxes in the US? Or how do we pay taxes on import duty in the Cayman Islands? Or right, There is no connection between those two things. So we have to bring it back and put it back into the sovereign world of currencies that exist, that we operate within. So that's not going away. So it's difficult to become the world's currency because governments need their own currency to extract seniorage, to extract taxes from you and other payments for, for government services. So could it be a reserve asset? Yes, like gold is a reserve asset. Does it become the reserve asset? Well, there is a world where it could be the reserve asset for the digital world, the collateral for the system. The problem is, is this where it gets really complicated because central banks want to get in on the action. Why? There's a whole bunch of other political reasons. But one of the reasons is the US dollar architecture is, is not suitable for the world that we live in. The US is currently 25% of global GDP. It's come down from 40%. But the US dollar is now 79.5% of all transactions and all trade. So the dollar is outsized versus the US. So there's not enough dollars actually, bizarrely in this world, that are floating around this system. They kind of get trapped in the debts and the banks and all, all the other places. So countries are finding that a problem. Countries like South Africa, it's the, suddenly your currency keeps moving when it's not anything to do naturally with South Africa, it's your access to dollars that become difficult. So central banks also are worried about the US moving away from global, uh, globalization and they own what's known as the SWIFT payment system. It's the me methodology by which we can make payments around the world. That's owned by the US and the US has weaponized it against countries like Iran, where they've shut them out of the Swiss payment system. And they've tried to do that with Russia too. So countries have got together and said, listen, this dollar system doesn't work for us. It makes life too complicated. If I'm a South African exporter, you know, the value of my exports goes up and down, you know, 30, 40% a year, it's crazy. And I can be shut off if I do anything wrong to America. So what we want is a payment system and a methodology that doesn't involve just the US dollar. So they start talking about digital uh, central bank coins, which means it's very efficient. Don't have to print currency. Everyone can, I can pay you instantaneously by a nice system of exchanges. I can exchange my coin for your coin. So we've got global transactions and you can do a number of things and I can still extract the taxation if I'm the government. Now, when you've got those digital coins and a Bitcoin world, okay, now you've got two worlds to speak to each other. They're both digital. So we're now not what you're not sending me emails and me sending you post. We're now speaking both in email. Okay, that, that's a world that works and it becomes interconnected. And it allows then the building of all applications on these kind of layers. 
and there happens to be other versions, whether it's whether it's um, Ethereum or whether it's EOS, and there's a whole bunch of other systems of which you can build these worlds, but around that. And I do see a world where Bitcoin is a reserve asset, but I don't think it's going to be the world's reserve asset. But it could be. It could develop that way. We just don't know. There's a lot of paths this could all go down. Yeah. No, I think that's exactly the same path. I agree 100%. And I think those other digital currencies will almost be the introduction. I mean, my mom will use that and say, oh, this is so easy to use. This Bitcoin thing also makes sense. Well, also, there's going to be a big change. And I think we're about to get them speaking at the Real Vision event uh, Monday, Tuesday, is Facebook came with a huge revolution. So, well, certainly for us, but in China, it's slightly different because it's been around for a while. But Facebook said, we want to start a digital currency. And as opposed to competing and creating a token system that gaming platforms have, or arguably Bitcoin is, they said, we don't do that. We're going to create a digital basket of currencies of which the US dollar is one of them. So it'll be the US dollar, the euro, the yen, um, the Aussie, you know, the Canadian dollar, the RMB. And I'm going to put them all together and create a basket currency called Libra. Now, if you think of that, if you remember what I spoke before about denominators, Bitcoin is denominated in dollars for most of us. But when you put the dollar as part of the basket, what is the denominator of that asset? Well, it's probably global money supply, how much printing happens, how much money there is. So that is much more stable. So now if you're the South African exporter and you use a Libra coin, you know that your payments are going to be very stable. Wow, that changes everything for you. But what changed it for Facebook is they have WhatsApp, one of the largest communication platforms on earth where you will be able to send me money in a millisecond. Okay, that's game changing because that, and this money is based on actually the central bank money. The, the money, so the central banks are quite happy for this. They want to figure out how to regulate it, but it makes sense for them. So there we go. Your mum is more likely to be using Libra before the, the country that she lives in has their own central bank coin, but that will come too. And then you'll be able to exchange Libra for central bank coins and Libra for central bank coins for Bitcoin and so on and so forth. And before you know it, I mean, you know, you send your mum some money, you know, the Cayman Islands banking system means, you know, you put your request in, the website doesn't work, you put it back in again, they have to call you back and verify you've now wasted two days. Then it goes to international wire transfer, you put the details in wrong, it bounces back. So you're now six days in, your mum eventually gets the money. Right? That is, or, and that's as long as you don't have any currency restrictions. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so that's a ridiculous situation considering I can send you an email and you'll get it instantaneously. Well, money is going to be like emails. It'll just flow instantaneously around the world. That's what a huge difference that is. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned regulations, um, and I wanted to find out from your perspective, what do you think are the biggest barriers, the things causing friction? Because I think the tech is there. I mean, someone could implement exactly what you're talking about tomorrow. What do you think are the things that are going to cause friction that might make this a while until it realizes? Well, there's a number of things is central banks have a monopoly on money and transfer payments. So it's going to take them a while to say it's worth relinquishing the monopoly as long as we can force people to have on-ramps and off-ramps so we get paid our taxes. And we need to make sure that it is not entirely anonymous because if not, we're creating a cash-based system of which for governments it's criminality, but it's not really criminality. It's we still don't get paid taxes in the black economy. So what they actually want is to make sure that this is visible. And I think um, the Silk Road case proved that basically Bitcoin doesn't hide anything. It's not very good for criminality. Cash is great for criminality because you can find everybody basically because of the blockchain recording every single transaction has ever been made. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting because the regulators will not want to get their arms around the whole thing. But we know because the Bank of England told us and the ECB told us and the BOJ told us 
and the PBOC have told us they're all moving to digital coins. So the, the, meth, the, the idea behind regulators has changed from, whoa, whoa, no, 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 you guys aren't doing this, to, okay, we get it, we're probably all going to have to do it. And we'll have to figure out a new system of regulation, infrastructure that works for this new world, much like the adoption of technology did in many other places. You know, they could have te kept the telephone or radio waves for governments only, but in the end, it doesn't work that way. It actually works for, you know, th these are game changers for the global economy. So I think, yes, they're fighting, but we hear, and I think you guys will hear, that the regulators are slowly going, I get it, everything is going digital. And, you know, what we have had to go through the journey of learning from, now you're younger than me, but, but we've had to go through, we didn't grow up where digital assets had a true value. You might have been a gamer, I wasn't a gamer, but gamers did. In a game, you got paid tokens, you could exchange them for things, and you could exchange them for digital things. So if you're in Minecraft, you'd exchange them for a sword. So you've, in your lifetime, gone through that understanding. I've had to get to that understanding. A Gen Zer, now, somebody under the age of 20, only grew up in a world where digital things have value. So there's no leap of understanding for them, it's ludicrous that to make a payment to somebody takes three days or four days when they're used to instantaneous payments. So it's a really interesting thing that adoption will come massively because young people have been doing this already. So it's, it's, a, it's really interesting. And I think the regulators, there's no way of stopping that. They just have to understand how to extract their slice of it. Yeah. So... I mean, we've talked about um, some of the regulators, normal Joe on the street. Um, I know you're very connected with the hedge fund world. You talk to some of the biggest guys in that space. Do you see them moving into the crypto assets more as well, um, especially looking at the returns, et cetera, at the moment? So on two levels. So I'm a macro guy. So macro guy, we look at multi-asset class world and the set of opportunities. That world has seen diminishing returns. Right now, in this very volatile world we're in, it's actually a very high return world for macro. But sooner or later, bond yields are all going to zero, and there'll be no bonds to trade, right? Bonds have been the, the largest alpha generator for the entire macro hedge fund industry for the last 30 years. They're going to zero, and they're not going to move again. We eventually will decouple from this world of debt and interest rates. But that may be indefinitely like the Japanese. So macro returns have compressed over time. Yes, this year we've had, after suppressed volatility, we get hyper volatility. But what's interesting is the first guy who, who changed his mind was a guy called Dan Moorhead, who's been on Real Vision a lot. So Dan was ex-Tiger, which was one of the biggest, most famous hedge funds in the world. Dan was a pure macro guy. He saw Bitcoin and he closed his hedge fund and said, nope, this is the future. And this is like five years ago. He's like, it, all expected future returns of all other asset classes combined, which is what macro is, is less than this one. Um, I didn't understand that at first. Then uh, another friend of mine, uh, Mike Novogratz, another Goldman partner who um, had founded Fortress, huge hedge fund, macro guy, closed up after a bad year and said, you know what, crypto, is bigger than all the expected returns of everything added together. Sure, he still trades a bit of macro because it's fun, but his whole bet is that. Followed by Mark Yusko, who a lot of people in Ireland know pretty well because he's always in the Cayman Islands. Um, followed by another friend of mine, Dan Tapiera, John Burbank, another famous investor, Passport Council, a real genius. He basically closed up his hedge fund, turned it into a family office, and dedicated his assets to crypto. Alan Howard from Brevin Howard, the biggest hedge fund firm in Europe for a long time. Alan has a crypto team working on his private capital and some of the capital of the fund. So many of these guys have just gone, this is, and these are really, really amazing people. And people like Lewis Bacon at More Capital, he's got a team. Paul Tudor Jones has just come into the space. They've all realized the expected future return of this thing is the biggest of anything they've ever seen in their lives, and it's worth dedicating their life to. Okay, that's extraordinary. These are really, really smart, experienced people. But then, you know, I, a lot of them read my research, Global Macro Investor, 
And I've been writing a lot about Bitcoin recently because I'm you know, phenomenally bullish against the backdrop you and I just talked about, about you know, a very uncertain world with lots of excess printing of capital. What's interesting is all the rest of the hedge fund guys, the CIOs and founders are all hitting me up saying, okay, so where do I start? Which account do I open? How do I do it? Where do I store it? So I can see it firsthand that it's happening. And Paul Tudor Jones was the big headline one from this year because Paul is a, and I've known him my whole career, he trades liquid things, futures, things he understands, nothing complicated. And he's like, okay, Bitcoin's expected return is higher than anything else. So I've now got an allocation to Bitcoin, which was basically the green flag for everybody to get involved. If Paul Tudor Jones is in it, we're all doing it. So hedge funds are setting up entities to trade it. They're doing it themselves. There is more coming and there are hedge funds in the space who are solely trading digital assets, which I know a whole ton of those. And we haven't even started what this digital assets, what the digital assets are that we're going to have. Right now, we just know a few of the currencies and a few of the tokens. But this, we haven't even started what the opportunity is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, we've seen similar things, seen lots of very interesting players coming into the space. I wanted to stop there for a moment. One of the things for me that's very interesting at the moment is We've seen that in the last few months, the S&P 500 and Bitcoin have actually been fairly closely correlated. And everyone's been talking about that decoupling when Bitcoin will decouple from the S&P. What do you think is going to have to happen for that to actually occur? So I've thought a lot about this. Why is Bitcoin trading like a risk asset? That, that's what we basically are asking here, because, you know, copper has been trading the same and many of these things. So when you have to think about Bitcoin, you need to think, what is the flow of people involved? Who are the people who are trading this? Well, there's a bunch of people like me and you who just buy it and don't do anything again with it. And that's the majority of the universe. So who are the people making price at the margin? It's either new people coming in to buy and hold it, or it's a trading community doing something else. So because of this rare thing that we all hold it and don't trade it, so we can focus on, okay, who are the guys who are actually buying and selling it? There's a bunch of retail guys. Okay, well, the retail guys have also been driven by the same checks and stuff that central banks gave out, uh, governments gave out to people to stimulate. So that money's leaked into the Bitcoin market, but it's not been as bullish for the Bitcoin market. Why is that? Because there's another huge development going on, which is that there is a a derivative market being built. That is the big development. Exchanges like BitMEX and then the option exchanges. So first I'll start with the BitMEX. BitMEX is a hundred times levered um, exchange. Um, and it, has, it does huge volume. And it's really for Chinese kind of gambler style traders. It's a very active market. The problem is when you've got a hundred times levered vehicle, if the price moves against you a little bit, you get stopped out. And the exchange has automatic stopping out rules within it. So what you've got is something now that becomes a risk asset because there's a lot of that risk seating, risk aversion behavior because I've, I've put money in with leverage, right? Which is like the S&P and futures markets, they all become similar. So that's becoming a, a problem. Well, not a problem, that's a feature. Now, what's interesting is if you were to draw Bitcoin down 10% overnight, you basically clear out all of the leverage in one go because the stops are very tight because it's 100 times leverage and it's the, the, the exchanges actually liquidate people. So I think that's a feature that disappears. And here's how I think it disappears. The other issue, why has Bitcoin been hitting 10,000 and not moving? Well, people are now getting paid, and this is a mind-blowing concept, yield in digital currencies. So Bitcoin and other digital currencies have a yield in the process known as yield farming. So you can be lending out your Bitcoin to let's say people like BitMEX to use for derivatives and you get paid an income. Now, a lot of people are using that. So some people are lending out their Bitcoin or their Ethereum and getting 100% returns or their stable coins, which is another part of the equation. 100% annualized returns. Now that's a super normal profit, it won't last. But it means there's a lot of people lending their coins, which means there's more coins available for short sellers, which means there's a cap on the price. The other structure is options. People have been selling long-dated style options. 
whether implicitly or explicitly, in Bitcoin. Because you and I, we hold our Bitcoin. We don't do anything. So why not sell some, get some yield? And how that yield's generated is selling an option. Now, the problem is, is one day Bitcoin breaks through 10,000. It starts going up and all of the people who are short the options are now suddenly short Bitcoin and they have to start buying it. All of the guys on leverage who were short all get stopped out of the leverage. And before you know, it goes from 10,000 to 15,000 and off it goes. And then it decouples from the S&P. So it's when one of these things at the margin happen, and I think it's on the upside and not the downside just because of the structure of how it works. So eventually, because of the upside options that everybody's essentially short, that they do that. There's another interesting component to the optionality in, the, in, in Bitcoin. It's currently a $200 billion market cap asset. Pretty small, really, for an asset. To call it an asset, it's actually a bit of a push. It's a thing that's worth $200 billion. Well, we know and you know that all the institutions, from Fidelity through to, you know, you name it, are all looking at it. And they're all thinking, do I need to do anything here? But it's a bit small, maybe I don't. But I tell you, if Bitcoin goes up to 30,000, so it now has a $600 billion market cap, well, that's gonna incrementally bring in more people. If it goes up to a trillion dollar market cap, it's gonna bring in almost everybody, and that takes it up to a $2 trillion market. Everybody is short Bitcoin. They know they need to buy it. They can't buy it until the market cap gets big enough. As the market cap gets big enough, it forces the next buyer in. It's a really fascinating price dynamic because everybody's kind of figured out, okay, this has an important role to play. Yeah, no, that'll be, it'll, it'll be an interesting day, if I can put it that way. The day that you go past that point and you yeah. start making that run, I'm sure a lot of people are going to have a fun day. Yeah. Um, you sort of touched on the next thing that I wanted to chat to you about. Um, I know companies like A16Z, et cetera, they've invested, I think they just created a fund of 500 million for DeFi. So you talked about yield farming, you talked about MakerDAO, DAI, those kinds of things. What do you think about these protocols that are completely decentralized? They are completely transparent. You can see how they work. So it's almost like the traditional financial system. You can actually see the inside of it. Do you think people are going to really start adopting that? And that's going to replace our traditional financial systems? For sure. So if we think the beginning part of our conversation, we started with what is a store of value? We then went talked about, okay, what is a reserve asset and collateral and how do governments interact with this and how do they feel about it, which is the regulation part. Okay, and we hinted at, but this is only the start. There is a layer that gets built on top because once you've got a digital platform with a value system and a means of exchanging it and plugging it into the rest of the system, what we call on-ramps and off-ramps, well, then you can change all of finance because everything can be distributed and everything can be on a blockchain and everything can be instantaneous. And then you've got this trusted store of value where you can embed smart contracts and you can embed all sorts of things. So now you start thinking, oh wow, okay, if we've just reinvented money, we can reinvent a financial system and we can reinvent all the architecture for all of it. And that is what is going on. So DeFi is just part of it. It is. You know, we haven't talked about the tokenization. We haven't talked about, you know, all the other developments, you know, just from straightforward payments platforms to custody, to insurance contracts, to global supply chains, to everything that is all going to change. You know, we are going to go through the same level of change we went through from maybe 1992 to current date with the internet and what it did versus this. And again, it's a red herring because people say, well, it's too complicated. I don't understand the internet. I have no idea how I can send you an email. I don't understand how telephones work. I have no understanding how this video works because we don't have to. Now, yes, a lot of this stuff is very complicated, but in the end, you won't notice because your mum will be paying you as a, to go and buy yourself a drink on your birthday present and instantaneous money over her Facebook, which she spends all day on, you know, and it interacts when you don't spend all day on Facebook, but it'll go to your Instagram account because you hang out on Instagram and you can collect your money there. You know, that's what the world we're going into. We don't need to understand any of this, really. You can. It's good to understand the base layer, Bitcoin. Understand the base layer and the value system and everything else 
just builds on top. So, you know, Andreessen Horowitz are unbelievably smart. I mean, Mark Andreessen is one of the smartest people in the world. I mean, he figured out very quickly, I think, probably the most profoundly important statement in the business world of the last 30 years, which is software is eating the world. And it sounds like a flippant, easy thing to say, but what people don't realize is software is going through, destroying each and every business and turning on its head. And then it moved into things like cars and being able to rent out your asset like your house in Airbnb. Well, that is exactly the same world where Bitcoin decentralizes stuff as well and we get control over our own assets and we can tokenize them and do them. So it was a small leap of faith to go, uh, software is eating the world and then saying, okay, once that's happening and the world has gone digital, which is what software is, then all digital value now becomes the biggest part of the, food, of the equation. So the transfer, the storing, the exchange, all of that. And, you know, so, you know, it's super, it's super interesting. And I, I think I wouldn't bet against them. I, they're dead right. Yeah. Well, I think we can, we can almost say crypto is eating the world of blockchains. That's the, the next version of that. Yes. I, I, and I think, that, I think that's right. And again, people will never see blockchain. It's a relevance to most people. But like the Brave Browser guys, and I think the Block One guys have just brought out Voice, which is going to be a blockchain-driven browser. If you think of the world that you will see, you will see a world where the incremental profits, the, no, the supernormal profits that accrue to Google and Facebook will not be there. Because guess what? Somebody else is after their money. And who is that person? Me and you. We should get paid for our attention spans on their network. We should take a share of it. So when you start implementing tokenization and blockchain, you get to accrue value yourselves. You change, you can change the entire value equation. I can now own my data in a trusted, secure place, and I can lend it to you to use for your advertising purposes, but you're gonna pay me for it. Right now, we go onto Facebook and for the facility of using a site that connects us and our friends and our parents, we actually give our attention spans. And that trade-off is not fair. It also, because they're accruing supernormal profits. Also, we have a problem with fake news. We have a problem with verification. Blockchain solves verification. So we know what is trusted and what is not. So if news stories, as they're released on the blockchain, then news sources are, tra are traceable. And therefore you can't create fake news because you can tell what sources. But, you know, these are the things that we won't even notice, but they're coming. Yeah, no, 100% agree with you. I wanted to give this a little bit of a Cayman angle as well. I know you've been based in Cayman for a while. Yeah. You're running your company from over here. Where do you see a place like Cayman Islands playing a role in this, where these companies are completely decentralized and worldwide? I think if Cayman can grasp this, they have a once in a generation opportunity that is larger than the opportunity that they had going into the um, tax neutral jurisdiction opportunity. We're about to move into this digital world Everything is about to be tokenized. Firstly, they should immediately change to a digital currency internally. Let's make payment systems. I mean, you know, China does it, India moved to a, 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 a digital payment system. Let's show the world. It's simple because we're a super smart island, of very motivated people. We don't have taxes apart from import duties and it, it comes at the import point and not from, um, from payment of goods. Super simple. So we should be doing that for starters, allowing people to come in here and realize you download your Cayman app and you can buy and sell your, you, you, you know, as a tourist, you can even engage in that as you can in China. But more than that is the Cayman Island Stock Exchange should think, could we play a role in this? Could we list tokens? Could we create a digital Cayman where it's not, we just attract companies to the island, but we actually become 
the financial center of the digital world, where we attract talent because this COVID experience has taught us we can all live where we want to and we can still work. So why should they not live in Cayman? Why should we not be able to get that second pipe from Florida with higher data speeds to give us the ability to scale a tech industry here? Because doing that is going to make Cayman five times more important than it is today. Because today, it's the financial services firms that are at the end of the food chain or part of the food chain. That's the only reason we're a financial center. We're not actually a financial center. We're a financial services center. But we could be a digital value, you know, the center of the global digital economy. That's what's up for grabs. Other people are going to look at this too. I don't know some of the other island nations are looking at it. But Cayman is uniquely situated because A, all the law firms, the accounting firms here, are the people who basically invented tokenization. These guys, you know, all of you guys have been at the absolute forefront of changing the world. Well, if we're not going to use it to our advantage in Cayman, what was even the point? And this COVID opportunity is one of those opportunities where, you know, as we bring in 5G and all of these things change, that we can really play a big part in the world. And because it's digital, it doesn't involve developing all of the island. You know, there's ways that value can accrue without destroying all the resources. We don't have to have cruise ships because we can replace them with some great businesses. There's so many opportunities. And don't forget, if this is the future of finance and the value system of exchange and of storing stuff, and we're a great legal and tax jurisdiction, well, my God, that's a supercharger for this island. If, if we can get the government to move and let businesses start the initiative on island and let's start moving fast. Because, you know, you need to operate like a startup in this world now. You don't get to be a creaky, slow government who goes, well, I'm not sure about You don't get these chances. You have to act like a startup. You have to be nimble. You have to be quick. And you have to have a vision and then adapt and go. Yep. No, and I, I also think there's a very, very bright future uh, if we make the right moves there. Um, Ro, yeah, I, I mean, sorry, I've, I speak to a lot of these big you know, crypto guys who have some presence on Ireland, some have a little more presence, and they're like, well, we're trying to speak to government. We, want it. we just want Cayman to work for us because we just think it's the place. So the companies are already here. They could scale on Ireland if we put the right incentive schemes in place, and it's not that difficult to do. Hmm. Yep. So, I mean, I've really enjoyed the conversation, but I know we've got a bunch of people who also want to ask you some questions. So I don't want to hog all of the limelight. Um, before we go into the questions, I quickly just wanted to give you a chance. If people want to follow you, learn more about what you guys are doing, what's the best place to do that? Yeah, the best thing is find me on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, it's at Raoul, R-A-O-U-L, G-M-I. You can find me on LinkedIn. Or if you want to see what we're doing in the video world, I mean, again, we're a Cayman Islands business that probably has the largest global footprint of any business in the Cayman Islands because we create financial video. We're like the Netflix of finance meets the economist of the video age. Just go to realvision.com and check it out. And if you are really interested in this, as I said, we've got, I think, the biggest crypto event in the world. I think there's at least 7,000 people joining us for it. Um, so realvision.com forward slash crypto or look at my LinkedIn feed or Twitter feed and come and join that because we've got all of the biggest speakers from all the exchanges, from the DeFi projects, to the macro guys, to economists, everybody's coming together in one place for this Real Vision event. And it's on Monday and Tuesday, so get your tickets while you can. Yep, really looking forward to that. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Caitlin. I'm sure she's got a few interesting questions for us. Great. I do. All right, so let's get started because we have quite a few questions. We'll start with Marco's proposal to the group. He says, to replace USD as the de facto global currency, one must mount a replacement better, stronger, faster, more equitable, quietly, and then silently gain major adoption before revealing it. What are your thoughts on this approach? Raul, maybe you can start with this one. I don't think when an economy is 25% of the world's economy, you can take away its reserve currency status. It doesn't happen. It's not by adoption of currency, it's by usage. So it's very difficult to avoid the use of the dollar. So I don't think that happens. Now, 
does the US relative importance in the world change over time? Probably. And is that the opportunity? For sure. Uh, are the central bank digital coins going to create basket currencies that weights the dollar less? For sure. Can Bitcoin take a share of that market? For sure. But I, I don't think there's a, I don't think that an independent reserve currency takes over the world. I don't know. Pietro, what do you think? Um, I share that view. I think we'll, we'll see a mixed bag. Sort of what you were talking about is you'll have Bitcoin as a reserve, you'll have other things as reserves. Um, but having one dominant player, I mean, we can get there eventually, but that's not going to be a quick process. No. All right. The next question, Neil asks, um, he says, will Cayman's new crypto law affect individual Caymanian cryptocurrency holders? Maybe, Petri, you can start with this one. So, yep. So we've got the brand new virtual asset um, law that came out. That virtual asset law is specific to virtual asset service providers. So it's specific to the companies that are issuing tokens, etc. And it's fully compliant with the FATF laws. So for you as an individual, um, that law is not going to have any impact on you personally um, because you won't be... Uh, classified as a virtual asset service provider. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, Dan has a question, it's a bit of a lengthy one, but I'll get through it. He says, Bitcoin has been a great non-correlated asset to traditional markets in its lifetime. However, in recent months during COVID, we have seen it move more closely in line with them. Do you feel, do you foresee a move away from this correlation in the near future? What would it take for those to separate more definitively? This feels like one of the COVID press briefings. Yes, I think we answered that one. Um, you know, I, I think it's the upside move that eventually decouples it. I think the long-term correlation is less clear than the short-term correlation. And to be honest, Bitcoin has been the best performing asset in all recorded history thus far. Um, it doesn't look like anything else. So implicitly, there might be short term correlations. But really, you know, at a head check, it doesn't look like anything else on Earth. Okay. Um, Nadish says, it would be good to have Revel's thoughts on the options expiring tomorrow on Bitcoin and his anticipated price movement. Bullish? Question mark? I don't know. I don't really operate in the short term. So it's not something I massively focus on. And when I'm talking about the options before, these are longer dated um, options that are not really on exchanges. So it's not something, not something I look at uh, per se. So I don't know. Okay. <coughs> Um, Thrive also wanted to find out, Raul, what your thoughts are on BAT, the basic token, a uh, basic attention token by Brave. I think you mentioned it earlier, but if you have anything else to expand on. Yes, look, I think it is a big breakthrough. Um, I know very a lot of people are interested in Brave. They're getting decent adoption right now as well. You know, I you know, know the guys, I've met the guys, I've met them at KPMG as well. Um, I don't know about the token itself. You know, it's very difficult. It's like It's like buying equities again. You know, it's you need to do your homework and figure it out. But it, to me, it feels like, you know, if it was a stock, you'd say, you know what, it's pretty interesting. Maybe there's something to it. I need to see how the business grows, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's not the first one we're going to see, the last one we're going to see. I think that whole system of us being able to monetize ourselves by leasing our, our data, i.e. our attention or our you know, online data of where we've been and what we've done, I think is only going to become a more important part of the world. So it's, this is the first step and the brave guys are brave in themselves by doing it. Excellent. Petri, did you have any comments there? Oh, I agree. I think what makes tokenization so interesting is that you can now create business models that previously you couldn't. So now you can create a business model where you can actually pay people for their attention directly. Our traditional systems didn't allow that. So I'm actually looking forward to the ideas people come up with that this new system enables. It's also interesting within that is, this, is the micropayments. Now, we think of micropayments as small payments, but the digital world allows it to stream instantly when you're watching. So payment, 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 payment. You stop watching, stop payment. Okay, that, that, that completely revolutionizes how we can break down our time slots um, in terms of what we do. So 
this micropayment approach to this that's coming as well is going to be huge. All right. Um, Danielle asks, she says, what is your opinion on wrapped Bitcoin being used on the DeFi ecosystem? This opens up so many avenues for BTC holders to interact on the Ethereum, Ethereum, Ethereum blockchain and interact with all of other DeFi functionalities. Um, yeah, any suggestions there? What is uh, your opinion on wrapped my, Bitcoin? My, my, my view is, and I don't know much about this or at the outer edges of my knowledge base, maybe Petri knows more, but for me is all of these systems will integrate over time. And there'll be Bitcoin stuff built on Ethereum and Ethereum stuff built on Bitcoin. And there'll be central bank stuff built on Bitcoin and Bitcoin stuff built on central bank infrastructure. Everything will end up talking. It has to. It's like my Apple Mac can talk to your PC and we don't care how. Now, I remember when we first started, we couldn't do that because bloody Microsoft Office would only work on one thing and not the, that, that. These are just small stepping stones to worlds where we don't see anything because everything talks to each other. You know, because don't forget, I can pick up again my Apple phone and call an Android phone, right? Two operating systems, but I'm indifferent to it. It makes no difference to me. I've just happened to choose this one. So, so I think overall, it's all a good development. Excellent. And I know we're getting close to five, so I just want to conclude today's sessions and just reach out and see if you guys had anything else to add to the conversation before we head off. My only thing is, let's get K-Man sorted out first. Let's, let's do something special here. Let's do something that makes us proud that we leave a legacy of incredible foresight. If you look at great countries like what Singapore did, they had a foresight. That was based around medicine. It was based around shipping. It was based around some forward-thinking things at the time. We have a big opportunity, a once-in-a-generation opportunity here, and we could do something great. All the skills are here. And also, the other thing I'll leave you with is buy Bitcoin. I think I'm going to agree with that one. Um, for everyone, buy Bitcoin. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, Raul, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. We certainly do have a lot to think about and to digest. Um, for everyone tuning in, please do continue the conversation online. And if you haven't already, make sure to become a member of Digital Cayman. Memberships are currently complimentary, thanks to Cayman Tech City's support. Um, you can register through digitalcayman.com. And finally, thank you to our sponsors, Cayman Tech City, who have partnered with Digital Cayman and the Blockchain Association of the Cayman Islands. They're all working together to drive to make the Cayman Islands a global hub uh, for innovation and for digital and for technology. So thank you. I guess that wraps everything up for today and we'll see you next time. <laughs>